I'm Jeremy Veldman. Welcome to the October 2020 meeting of the Memphis Astronomical Society. Now, if you're an amateur astronomer and you're looking to up your game a little bit, then this is a presentation you're not going to want to miss. We had Tom Field, contributing editor for Sky and Telescope magazine, and the creator of the Real-Time Spectroscopy, or RSpec software, speak to us tonight. Now, Tom has been a contributing editor for Sky and Telescope magazine for about seven years. He created this program about a decade ago. It's available on his website, rspec-astro.com. We'll share those full details for you in a minute. But many of us are amateurs. We have telescopes. We've been in our backyards or at dark sky sites. We've looked at stars. We've looked at deep sky objects. We've seen them either through the eyepiece of a telescope or we've done some imaging as astrophotographers. Tonight's presentation is the opportunity for you to up your game a little bit and do some real science, specifically spectroscopy. Tom shows you how to capture a star or any other deep sky object and actually capture the spectra of that object and filter it through his software and do some real science. Fascinating presentation. And this tool is not only available for professionals, but also for amateurs like you and I, just regular backyard astronomers. And it really enhances your understanding of astronomy. And it's really the opportunity to connect on a deeper level rather than just the aesthetic level with, with science and astronomy in general. So now because of the nature of this presentation and that this is a special speaker, we wanted to give him as much time as possible. So we're gonna tweak the program for you just a little bit tonight. We're gonna save the usual beginning preliminaries until after the presentation. So be sure you stick around for that. We wanted to jump in and get into the main part of the program as quickly as possible to give Tom as much time and to give you the opportunity to see this talk and get the full benefit on the front end. Before we get started, just a couple of quick things. First of all, we're the Memphis Astronomical Society. We're a nonprofit organization dedicated to spreading the passion and interest in astronomy and related sciences. You can check us out on our website, memphisastro.org. And if you want to join our email list and receive updates, we send them out about once a week about upcoming events, including other, other meetings that we have scheduled or observing sessions when we get back to our live observing sessions. Then go to the website joinmas.com and simply enter your name and your email address. You can also check us out. We're on social media. Just do a search in Facebook for Memphis Astronomical Society, or you can actually join our group at groups slash Memphis Astro. And of course, be sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel, Memphis Astron Society. Uh, we have over a thousand subscribers now. would love to continue to have you as a subscriber and continue to send you updates. So without further ado, we're gonna show you the live Zoom call that we recorded on October the 2nd for our 2020 October meeting. And be sure you stick around for the preliminaries and some other announcements at the end of this presentation. So here it is, our call with Tom Field, of Sky and Telescope Magazine and the, and the creator of the RSpec software program. Well, welcome. Secondly, we're pretty excited about what you have to show us tonight. We were checking out your website and this uh, program you developed and the fact that you can do not only backyard astronomy, backyard astrophotography, but now backyard spectroscopy is pretty incredible. It is. It, it's, I'm still stunned that it's possible, the truth be told. It really is. So there's Keith. Hi, Keith. Hey, Tom, how are you? Doing great. Thanks for uh, all the background work you did to make this all happen. Hey, thank you. Yeah, I, I, uh, sorry, I was trying to take the uh, scotch tape off of my computer camera. Oh, yeah, You do that too, okay. Yeah. It's just entirely too creepy to think that somebody might be looking at me staring at a screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> So does the club have a dark sky site? That we you do. Use? Where's that? It's about 45, well, about 30 to 45 minutes from Memphis in a place called Burton Sugar Farm near Michigan City, mm -hmm. Mississippi, of all places. Uh-huh. So I, we I do have some light domes out there, but it's, it's at least dark enough where we can see the Milky Way and, oh, and get as many deep sky objects as we need to. We're yeah. southeast of the city. Uh-huh. Oh, good. Well, very cool. Uh, and what about, do you do much outreach as a club when things are normal? We do, actually. We, we, we not only have our monthly meetings and in our observing sites, we also do in-town observing sessions. Last Saturday was International Observe the Moon Night. We typically would do something for that. 
as well as some other, you know, in town events for bright objects like the moon and planets. Right. We speak in libraries, we speak at schools, any opportunity really to do outreach. Wow, very cool. Yes. Very neat. Now, what about all those other shy people who haven't turned their cameras on, for goodness sake? How are we supposed to know who we're talking to? <laughs> all right, there's Ann. Thanks. I was going to say, uh, what made me think of that is, uh, especially since this is a first time Zoom meeting for the club, um, you know, most of you are probably, uh, probably have the, uh, oh, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Can you turn that off, though? Because I wanted to show them uh, uh, something about that. Let's see. There we go. So in your upper right hand corner is this little tic-tac-toe button. Right now you're probably seeing me just in the middle of the screen, huge me. You don't need to count the hairs on my eyebrows, I assure you. So, you know, and right now you've got this little thin strip across the top, maybe, of just a handful of videos. But if you press that button, if you see it, that has that little tic-tac-toe thing, and it's a toggle, you can go back and forth. Then you'll see all the videos at once. Uh, and you can go back and forth. Oh, okay, Julie and Peter. Well, when you're done dinner, I want to see that camera come on. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, yeah, there's so look at all these people here who are too shy to turn their cameras on, for goodness sake. This is supposed to be a social event. All right, there's Terry, thank you. <laughs> So where do you normally meet when, again, things are normal? We meet at Christian Brothers University. It's in kind of the Midtown area of Memphis. Uh -huh. Our meetings are on Friday nights, the first Friday of every month, typically from 8 until about 10 o'clock p.m. Oh, that's nice. And Rhodes College is right around the corner. We've got Ann Biano on tonight, too. Hello, I'm here. To put you on the spot, Ann. I'm here. And Tom, we use your RSpec system in our astronomy class. So I'm very I excited was, you're here tonight. I was trying to figure out how I was going to do the soft sell, Ann, you know, university <laughs> money, deep pockets and all that. But I've already got your money, for God's sake. We already talked, I think, a few years ago to try and get it working on a network of multiple computers. Oh. So you're at Rhodes. Didn't Rhodes yes. come into, the, into our current event news in the last couple of days? <laughs> Yes, it did. <laughs> Amy Coney Barrett is an alum of Rhodes College. Rhodes Scholar, I think, is what she was called. No, she's not a Rhodes Scholar. She's an alum of the college, yeah. That was, that was what, where it came to my attention in that whole discussion. Well, good. It's cool that you teach astronomy. Do you do any hands-on with the students, or is that just too much of a challenge given nights? Oh, no. We do, they use the RSpec system when they learn about spectroscopy. And they use C8 out on our observing deck when it's really? clear. Wow, very cool. There are not a lot of schools that do that, I've found, uh, just because of the challenges that you've, you've surmounted that they haven't, you know, just getting the kids in and, you know, getting hardware where they can get access to it and all that stuff. So it's great that you do that. If only we were located out in the country where it's not so bright, it would be fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, have you been to the AAS? Have I met you there perhaps at some time? Um, I've been to one, but it's, it's been a few years. There's a guy named Ron DiIlio at the University of North Texas. He's the astronomy lab director. He runs, this is mind blowing to me, and he runs 2,000 people, uh, Astro 101 liberal arts students a year through a lab, a hands-on lab in teams. It's, I went down there because I couldn't believe it, you know, uh, and they've got, you know, a, a series of C8s set up and, and they have TAs operating the telescopes as telescope operators. And so the students, and they get to focus and do some things and they capture some specter, but it's a very cool, very cool project that they do lab. It can be done. <laughs> yeah, not by me, not by most people. It's a really remarkable. Excellent. So does this meeting start at uh, the top of the hour? So we got some time to chat or am I cutting into our time here? We got some time to chat. Um, typically, we start at 8 o'clock. We did announce that we were going to start at 7.45, but quite frankly, it's your show. So, um, you know, what do you start expect? at 7.45. You think there are going to be more people straggling in? or Typically, a lot of people jump on just before 8 o'clock. Let's wait. I'm not in any hurry if everybody's cool with that. Hey, we're, we're doing gonna well. mean it, you, it'll be up. You'll be up later, and I'll have to work harder to keep you all awake. That's the problem. 
<laughs> Not at all. We're pretty excited to see what you got to present. Good. I'm glad to hear it. And you've done a lot of outreach too. You've spoken at a lot of events. Have you spoken in a lot of schools and presented this? Not a lot of schools. Schools is a little bit more of a challenge. Um, mostly um, uh, astronomy clubs and, you know, NEEF and things like that. Um, I've been doing a lot this year because the clubs are, all of a sudden clubs are happy to have remote presenters. That wasn't the case over the last 10 years. Funny you how know, things I, change. Yeah, it's wonderful. Cause I'd go, you know, you, we, I was using WebEx at the time. We'd have to do a meeting before, like a week or two before to make sure they had the bandwidth at the school they were meeting in or whatever. And it, it consumed a lot of my time. Now I just say Zoom and they go, hey, we're in, you know, it's like, oh, thank goodness. And it's better for me because I get to see people. Whereas when I'm talking to an auditorium, although they have a webcam, it's just an audience I, I'm seeing. This way, I'm really going to be able to actually call out the names of the people who fall asleep, you know? Easy. <laughs> and a couple questions. Tonight's presentation, is it standard PowerPoint? Did you have um, demos, uh, video, anything like that? Both. Yeah, I'm going to do a little power, mostly PowerPoint. I'm going to pop open the software for a few minutes. Uh, and uh, maybe during the Q&A, I have a video or two to show, a short video, depending on where we go with the Q&A. You guys, you know, you're going to have to have one of those. Uh, where'd he go? Oh, there you are. Somehow the screen rearranged you. It's it did, written. didn't it? Yeah. Um, you're going to have to have one of those uh, crooks that you tug people off the stage with as, as it, you know, as it gets on like closer to midnight there, I, I feel free. I'm going to be up as long as you're going. You, you ain't going to put me under the table any day. I, I want to hear What's everything you have to say. Is my wife's going to drag me out of here for dinner? <laughs> well, I'm out in Seattle. Um, oh, are you? Uh, yeah. Did you get any, uh, how's, how have your skies been? Did we, any of our smoke reach your skies? Yes. Yeah. Good. You should suffer like we do. <laughs> well, we have beautiful sunsets, so we seem to get the upside, not as much of the downside. It's but it actually, does affect our seeing. Yeah, we've had a uh, we had a week a couple weeks ago that was bad, and now it's not so bad. California and Oregon are are still having problems. Oh, California, I guess is just awful. I talked to one of my clients. He's in Southern California. They're just they're having a, a just a well, Northern California too. It's just there there's just fires everywhere. I, I don't know how many of you recognize the name Richard Berry. You, some of oh, you yeah. recognize? So he lost his house in Oregon. Oh, and no. Uh, all of his telescopes, all of his, he was former editor and chiefest guy in telescope, wrote the CCD cookbook. Yeah. And uh, I built my first camera out of that book. Yeah. Yeah. Did you do that with the, uh, did you have the water cooled bucket next to your camera? Did you do that whole thing? I, I never went that quite that far with it. By the time I got into it uh, and started building my own camera, uh, they were becoming commercially available yeah. in a way that they could be afforded. So uh, uh, I got, I got one camera built and then stopped. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it, it, I mean, he's been posting on Facebook and, you know, his house is gone. He posted some pictures. But the good news is he posted the other day that he went, went by their safe deposit box and, and pulled out his backup drive that was stored off site. So that's a reminder. You need to get a, all of you need to get a backup off site. You know? Wow. It's one of those things that uh, is a pain in the neck until you need it. Yep. yep. So how has your year been? Have you have you done a lot of traveling this year? Or are you doing mostly remote events? No, there's no uh, no there's no traveling. I I actually have uh, a calendar on the wall in the other room, and uh, every time I stand in front of it and look and look at all the X's, I was going to be down at um, Oki Techs, and of course Neef was in April, and uh, just so many different conferences. Yeah, uh, so it just it's been a dead year for everybody. Yeah, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the El Dorado Star Party is the only one that's actually still on this year. I think I it's know. actually coming up this month. It, I think it could be done now in the right parts of the country, you know. I don't know, if it, I don't know what the rules are, but I think people can safe distance outside pretty effectively. While, uh, while we've got people still joining, I want to tell everyone that, uh, unfortunately, I set up the meeting and I have the power. So when we get into the presentation, I will probably mute everyone just to keep the background noise down. 
Um, and you're welcome to leave your cameras on. And in fact, I encourage you to turn them on now before the meeting gets started, just, uh, just to show your face and uh, let us see who all's here. Uh, most of the names I recognize, some I don't. So welcome to our visitors and uh, turn on the camera. Say hello. Don't be shy. <laughs> I can't remember. Uh, somebody remind me with Zoom. Is there a little place you can raise your hand for a question? Yeah, there is. Um, but that's in the uh, a different platform of theirs, I think. Or, or maybe it is in the chat chat window. Is there a hand raised there? Yeah, if you click on the chat button on the bottom, on the very bottom. Yeah. Yep. I don't see a hand raise there. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah, I, I think in their webinar software you can do that. But I yeah. think probably the best thing tonight is, uh, I mean, you can either uh, send a message to everyone with your question or just hold it. And when we're done, we can just open it up for a free for all. Uh, that way I don't get uh, distracted. We, we could be here all night. Oh, there's a box for reaction, says uh, Julia and Peter. Hey, if you're eating dinner, you shouldn't be type, typing text messages. <laughs> That's true. All right, we got about a minute here, and then I guess we'll um, sure we'll kick things off about eight o'clock. Most of the people are probably probably on. Those if, if anyone else is going to join, Tom, just to re just um, one other question. We are recording tonight. We are planning to publish this to our YouTube channel. Want to make sure that we have your approval to do so. You absolutely do. Thanks. Thanks for asking. Okay. I tried recording. I wanted to record a Zoom meeting I was in uh, uh, a couple days ago with about 25 people, but I, I didn't want them to be unspontaneous knowing the video was going. So I recorded it here and then I had to go to all of them and get permission and, you know, an, a, anonymous permission from them to use the video. Um, but I forgot to, I, in recording here, I forgot to turn on my mic. <laughs> And so this whole great webinar, it's not me talking, it's a conversational meeting. Everybody, you can hear everybody but me. And it's my meeting, for goodness sake. <laughs> anyway, all right, shall we get started then? Absolutely. Right. Great. Okay, thanks, everybody. It's nice to have a chance to hang out so I'm not just parachuting in and, and uh, don't, don't know anybody or the sounds of their voice. Uh, oh, there's a thumbs up, Julia and Peter. I see that. Tom, you're muted. So I was. Jeremy muted or Rick muted everybody and I forgot <laughs> to unmute. Um, thank you. So uh, for those of you who didn't hear me mention this earlier, if you're seeing me right now in the middle of your screen, rather than a whole bunch of videos, you're just seeing a little strip across the top. There's a button in the upper right hand corner that has this like, uh, I've been calling it a tic-tac-toe board, but it's sort of like a Rubik's cube too. If you click that button, it's a toggle, then you'll get to see more, more of the video uh, of the other attendees. It's better, you don't really need, as I said, to count the eyebrow hairs that people have. Uh, so this is a better view. But like I said, it's a toggle, you can go back and forth. All right, so I'm gonna talk for uh, 45 or 50 minutes. Um, I hope you have your uh, slickers on because it at times may feel like you're drinking from a fire hose, I apologize. Um, and uh, some people will, will uh, Oh, there we go, another message. So, um, oh, and there's Jerome. Okay, anyway, um, I'm gonna share my screen in a second and uh, then we'll jump in. Let's, let's get started. Ooh, hold on just a second. Let's, uh, what we need to do, I'm gonna stop that share for a second. Somehow um, PowerPoint sometimes decides that it's going to show on a different monitor than it was the last time. So give me just a moment here to set that up. Of course, this is something we could have done before, but I've never had this happen in the 60 presentations I've given this summer. So give me just a second to move some things around and we'll get started. Try and move some things around anyway. Uh, let's see what happens here. Very strange. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we want primary monitor. 
Okay, gee, what an ignoble start. So there's that, and there's that. And Jeremy, shake your head, you can see that prism? Great, good. I don't know who did that logo, but you didn't make it easy on me for me to steal it from your website. Um, I wasn't sure how much of it is actually your logo, if that's your logo or what. <laughs> anyway, so how have we managed to discover so much about the universe when, you know, really we haven't even left home? We're, you know, we've just barely ventured out. Let me just do a little rearranging here. Just a second. There. Uh, standard images, of course, we can, you know, learn a lot about the objects we're looking at. And we can get fleeting glimpses of a third dimension when we have an eclipse and two objects, you know, one passes behind the other. And if we wait a while, we have this, you know, fourth dimension of time. We can see stars going on and off. You can see some there. Uh, sometimes it's hard to find them. Uh, the upper right-hand corner is one that's pretty easy to see. And if we spread the colors out, we get an as if, notice the air quotes, we get an as if fifth dimension. This in itself, it's, it's beautiful. And furthermore, uh, it's sort of fun to figure out, well, where does, like, where does the green end and the yellow begin? This sort of looks yellowy, but that doesn't. But anyway, this fifth dimension reveals the barcode of the sun and other stars. And there's lots of things that these barcodes can show us and, and that we can learn from. Uh, I'm going to show you examples of some of these tonight, uh, and these will be things that, that you can actually do. I'll talk a little bit about how I got into this um, 11 years ago as we get a little further in. As I've been giving these talks, I realized that there were certain themes that, uh, that were on my mind, things I wanted to communicate, and I thought, let me just lay them out here so that I don't have to be subtle. I'm, I'm not known for subtlety. Um, and... Um, that way you get in a sense for, you know, what my agenda is tonight. My agenda twofold. I'd love to take some of your money and have you sell some of my stuff, but all I have to really do is sell you on spectroscopy. And that's really my main goal. I get more pleasure. And this is actually the truth. I get more pleasure. I, I actually got an email today from some guy, literally about a half an hour ago, who said, I'm really happy I've got something to be excited about again in astronomy. And I think the first thing, uh, and I hadn't thought about using that to introduce this first point. If you're an imager, maybe you remember that thrill of the first image you took, probably of the moon. <laughs> you know, for me, it was over, and probably you, it was overexposed. It was, uh, you know, unfocused, poorly focused, yet it was still absolutely gorgeous image. You were showing it to your wife and, and friends, colleagues, people were tired of you showing that white blob. Um, that thrill fades, but like this guy communicated uh, in this email, uh, you can recapture that thrill by uh, exploring other things. Maybe you want to do some science. That's why I got in. Uh, again, I'm not going to read these or get into a lot of details on all of them. Uh, none of us like spending a lot of money. It's certainly not out the gate when we're not sure it's something we're interested in. Uh, I'm going to show you some stuff that's really inexpensive tonight. And I think this is the point that, I, that is, is most rewarding to me, and that is when you own the data, when you have the data in your hand, your whole relationship to it changes. It's no longer just, oh yeah, there's that, the sort of that passive understanding that we get. It becomes more of a, well, I wanna learn a little more about this. And we tend to remember more about it after we've learned it. Um, so I found that, that uh, spectroscopy has really deepened my understanding uh, of visual observing. And I'll give you some examples as we, uh, we go on tonight. Even if you're not a, a, an imager, even if you don't even own a telescope, you're an armchair, perhaps you're just an armchair astronomer. Even then, what I'm gonna talk about tonight is the kind of thing that will be very helpful for you in enjoying astronomy, however you enjoy it. Because understanding a little bit more about how we came to know some of the things we know is, is always uh, helpful and, and interesting. But listen, we're, look, everybody here in this meeting is a learner you know, a self-motivated, self-guided learner. You wouldn't be here, and you like science. I mean, maybe you learn other things too, but uh, you, you learn science, and, and so that's the opportunity that, that you'll get a chance to see tonight. I asked about Dark Sky Site. I love the name. It was Sugar Something. I wrote it down. Uh, the Burton Sugar Farm. <laughs> I love the name. So spectroscopy is a lot less affected by light pollution than uh, 
I, I'll show you some examples tonight taken from right here in Seattle. Thank God you don't need to have a PhD or an undergraduate degree, because I don't. You know, I'm going to talk about a lot of things tonight. It, it's sort of like a broad river that's really shallow. <laughs> so, but there's no quizzes or final exams in, in our field, right? You learn what you want to learn. That's just the pleasure of it. I'm sort of all thumbs. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm not that big an imager these days. I don't have the patience or the equipment. I leave that for other people. I'm glad they do such a great job of it. And I break just about everything I touch anyway. So, you know, I think my, my favorite command in Windows is edit undo or control Z. <laughs> On a rare occasion, I thought you wouldn't it be nice to have a control Z in life. You know, when you take that turn, it, you look back on them, or you said something that you wished you hadn't said. So uh, I'm going to show you some turnkey fun. I know you do outreach. I asked about that deliberately before the meeting. And uh, I, I'll show you some cool, I'll try and remember to show you a couple of the screens that, are, that I'm going to show that are especially uh, helpful in outreach. This is a fantastic mentoring project for you. You can go into schools, uh, you know, if you have a relationship with a physics, chemistry, or astronomy professor, um, or you are one yourself in the case of one of our attendees, uh, you can coach a student to do some of the things I'm gonna show you. This, not that the goal is to win science fairs, but it's nice to have a shot at it. And you really do with this. It's surprising how often this kind of thing wins. And furthermore, you might want to do spectroscopy if uh, you'd like to hang out with a cool crowd. <laughs> That's not me, but there are thousands of people doing this these days. So it's not like you're on the bleeding edge. A little bit of science just to get everybody to the same level so we can talk about things. Uh, forgive me, a lot of this may be familiar to some of you. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton, of course, uh, discovered that we can split white light in a prism into its component colors or a rainbow. You can also do that by bouncing the light off of a DVD. I'm, want to get the, my sample DVD up into the frame here. And you can see the example there in the lower right hand corner. You can also pass light through a ruled glass called a diffraction grating and get the rainbow just like a prism. So Bunsen invented his Bunsen burner to study spectroscopy. He, he was a pyromaniac. He would burn things and then he'd look at the light through a prism using this instrument. And the cool thing is he kept great records and you'll see in a few minutes how those really helped us out. Um, and this guy over here, Kirchhoff, uh, we we're not going to get into a lot of detail about him. He was a contemporary and a, and a colleague of uh, Bunsen's. Um, one thing I wanted to mention about the Bunsen burner, uh, and that is Bunsen deliberately didn't apply for any patents on the Bunsen burner. He was quoted as saying, you know, he wanted the Bunsen burner to be available for anybody who wanted to further mankind and person kinds, human kinds, uh, a lot in the world. And uh, today, of course, there'd be a handful of patents on every little screw and bolt, I suppose. But this guy, Kirchhoff, I want to show you one screen. I'm not going to get into a lot of details on this screen. Just over here on the right, you can see there's two types of spectra you can get. And we'll talk in detail about these in a few minutes. One is you have a rainbow, right? This so this Roy G. Biv, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And you have gaps. And this one down here, this emission spectrum, you have a black background and you have some lines. Which of these two you get depends on things we won't talk about that Kirchhoff did, temperature of the gas around the star, things like that. And, uh, but the interesting thing is these are, the lines are in the same place regardless of whether it's an absorption or emission spectrum. And so we'll talk about how that happens uh, in a few moments. These are chemical fingerprints. Uh, and you can see here, for, for some reason, I took my hand off the mouse and I was going to actually touch the screen. Too many phone conversations, I think. Um, you can see this line in uh, the hydrogen that it doesn't, just doesn't exist in helium at all. And we'll talk about how these get created in just a moment. But hydrogen has uh, a couple well-known lines. And there's so much hydrogen in the universe. And it's so easy for us to use. Uh, that we've actually given those lines a name, the hydrogen bomber lines or series. And each line, just like we've, what, given Greek names to the uh, stars in, in brightness order in the constellations, we've given Greek names here to these lines. So for example, this hydrogen beta line is in, this is sort of what, robin egg blue, I guess. So um, you want to mute everybody again and I'll unmute myself if I can find myself. Thank you. You can hear me again, Jeremy? Good, thank you. So this is cool. 
And where are you, Ann? Oh, there you are. She's not on the screen right now. I, I was going to try and sell her one of these posters. In fact, let me just come up here while we're talking also and, and tell PowerPoint to keep my mouse visible. There we go. So this is pretty cool. It's a, a poster I created some years ago. We sell it mostly to schools, but also amateurs. Look at that on that hydrogen. There's those hydrogen alpha. There's that robin egg blue beta and gamma. And you can see these are, they're all different, right? Compare what I just showed you to say helium over here and the lines are all different. Or this is lithium that would be in your cell phone battery or uh, you know, in your laptop battery. So these really are fingerprints. Now we don't have to burn things these days. Uh, here we can see a, a gas tube. In fact, I've got one here just to show you. Uh, oh, there's Ann. Do you, Ann, do you use these or do you use uh, something else? Yeah, so you know that I'm about to burn my fingers if I spend too much time talking about this or get a shock, electrocute myself. But these are uh, just, this is a gas tube. This happens to be helium there. Um, I don't know if you could read that or not. Um, so, uh, and, and as I mentioned earlier, in fact, I don't know, Ann, if you've got this. This is, uh, I'm still trying to get some of that school budget out of her. Uh, this is a little camera for viewing gas tubes. Uh, and that's what's showing here. There's a hydrogen alpha, there's that robin egg blue, hydrogen beta, and so forth. All right, so uh, let's turn this gas tube off before I burn it up, because they don't last very long. I'm going to jump around time-wise, we'll move pretty quickly here. In 1835 or so, this French philosopher said the stars are just too far away to really ever know what they're made of. But it wasn't but a handful of decades later that all sorts of people were using spectroscopy to study the stars. You know, technology changes, science changes. He, he didn't know. If, and it also, he was wrong. He's a French philosopher, so what do you expect? But the thing is, I think about what is it today that we don't know that in 20 or 30 years, uh, they'll be looking back on us or 100 years from now and saying, you know, they didn't know that back then. Can you imagine not knowing that? I don't know what it'll be, whether it'll be chemistry or, you know, biology or, you know, who knows. So, so far, everybody I've mentioned in this uh, presentation have been old white men. So I want to show some of the women in the field who have done great things, and there's a ton of them. I'll only show a handful here. Annie Jump Cannon and her team, who were called the computers, uh, were prohibited from accessing telescopes at Harvard. And so what they ended up doing and doing quite well was examining the photographic plates that had the spectra that were being captured by the men. And they did an incredible job and they classified hundreds of thousands of spectra of stars. And, and as a result of that and their insight, creativity, and just hard work, they came up with the classification system that replaced all the preceding ones that didn't work. Uh, that, that really helped us understand the, the stellar life cycle. Priyamvada Nataraja, uh, she's at uh, Yale, and she studies uh, hyperactive black holes. Uh, Nancy Grace Roman uh, was the first astronomer at NASA. She got her PhD in the late 1940s, <coughs> excuse me, um, and her vision was the Hubble Space Telescope that's in the background there of that image of her, um, and she really, uh, you know, made it happen. She really drove it to happen. Elisa Quintana studies exoplanets and discovered uh, some exoplanets around some red giants, right in the Goldilocks zone. And Jedediah Eisler's at Dartmouth, and uh, she studies gravitational lensing in black holes. This is a fun slide. It's a relatively new one for me. I put it together this summer, and uh, it was really a lot of fun. I just, I had no idea how many women um, we're in astronomy, unrecognized, but the web really uh, was just fascinating to read. So we're making a little progress. There's a lot more to be made in the field, uh, but uh, I wanted to share these with you to, to sort of help that process along. A little bit of science here, and then we'll get into the fun stuff that you all want to do. Uh, the Bohr model of the atom, of course, you many of you will remember, has these, uh, these orbits uh, where there are electrons orbiting uh, the nucleus, and sometimes they jump between levels. And when they jump down or drop down, they give off energy. And that energy is often visible. So here you can see different jumps create different colors. So for example, if we look, let's see, this is level four. That's where it's starting here. And it's going down to level two. And that's where we get this uh, oh, robin egg blue. So that's the hydrogen beta. So if an electron jumps up, then it looks like that. And then we get one of those absorption spectra where we've got a rainbow with just a gap. 
So that's what's going on with the images and the examples we're going to look at a minute in a minute. And what's amazing to me is that with just really primitive tools, we can peer down into uh, an atom and see things that are going on. And I used to think that was cooler than I do now because I, re I realized it's sort of silly, but I realized everything we look at is that, right? Every color we see is because of something going on at the atomic level, you know, reflection and, and various color things. And so that to me is, is amazing. You don't have to look at a spectrum to see what's going on in atoms. You just look around, everything you look at, everything you think is that. Okay, here's an example of the Hubble spectrograph. Um, the space shuttle was servicing it. Uh, my teenage uh, grandson, he says that is not a scientific instrument. It's actually a refrigerator and it's filled with beer. And uh, he continues, he says that with the space shuttle when it flew at night, they were real party animals. And you know, in 24 hours on the space shuttle, they get a lot of nights. So we need not think about that much more. Here's a complicated uh, spectroscopy device, uh, Dale Mace's. I really like down here, he's got, you know, some sort of uh, tube for calibration. See those two little pins on the end there? Sometimes I picture, I need to ask Dale this someday. I, you know, here I'm spreading this story all over the country to a variety, I mean, lots of clubs. He'll start meeting people and they'll be telling him the story. I ought to preempt that. Because he, he, you know, I picture he's got two alligator clips with high voltage that he's trying to pin right onto those those pins. And I mean, of course, there's the risk of, uh, you know, getting a shock from the high voltage, but worse, if he draws a spark, he's going to lose and ruin his night vision for some time. So, but we don't need to use a complicated device like this. The examples I'm going to show you tonight mostly are of a star analyzer grading. Uh, that's what it's called here. It's about 200 bucks. And uh, it's an inch and a quarter filter cell with the grading uh, mounted inside of it, uh, sandwiched in glass. So it's, it's uh, really durable. Here's the first example I wanted to look at with you. So this is the star analyzer mounted on a DSLR. And there's a spectrum down there of Vega. There's hydrogen alpha. And there in the robin egg blue is hydrogen beta and hydrogen gamma. So I'd show you this. I mean, look, there's no tracking on this. It's small aperture. It's really not the easiest thing to do. Uh, but it is an inexpensive way that some people get started. And the reason I like to show this is because I really want to sort of make it clear there's no magic here. There's no magic box with mirrors and lenses and things. It's just this piece of glass, uh, which is pretty remarkable. So there's lots of ways to mount the grating. Uh, one is that we saw on the previous screen uh, on the lens cap threads. We have a little adapter we sell that adapts these uh, these uh, lens cap threads to the inch and a quarter. And with this, the light goes through the grating first. Uh, so the, the light's parallel, so you get a little higher resolution and then it goes through the lens. But you can use here, uh, you know, a standard fits camera, cooled, uncooled. You can use, uh, this is, let's see, this is a ZWO, uh, what, 178? video camera. It can be mono, it can be color. Oftentimes the grating just screws right on. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, or down here you can mount it in a filter wheel. So there's lots of ways to mount the grating. There are higher end devices. They're literally an order of magnitude more expensive. It's not often you get to talk about things in orders of magnitude like this, but you know, going from something very inexpensive to this, it's a big jump. And it's also a big jump in terms of uh, difficulty in use. Because these things have like a 20 micron slit, you get higher resolution. And I'll show you a couple examples tonight of that and how it's superior. But it, it's, a, it's a huge learning curve to start with these. So almost nobody starts with them. Or this is sort of cool. It's a 3D printed uh, and it, the plans are available online. And then the parts cost about 500 bucks. But the same, pro, the same challenges exist in terms of getting started. You can piggyback a DSLR on your current telescope. So you can do two things at once. Okay, so we're now, we've got that all behind us. Uh, let's see what we can actually do. So you take a star, you put a grating in the light path, you get this rainbow that again, falls on your sensor. Let's look at a really great example. So these are different spectra captured at a different time by Torsten Hansen. And you can see up here, he used an eight inch Newtonian and uh, that DMK is an imaging source video camera. Now, each of these, uh, this is in temperature order. So these are the hot stars. You can see B stars there going down to the cool type M stars. So we're not going to look at a lot of detail on this, but just look at it from like the 20,000 foot view. You can see very clearly the different temperature stars have different spectra. 
And this is what the uh, computers, uh, the women at Harvard were studying, and that is what order, you know, what, when do lines come and go? For example, notice that, well, this is like a forest of lines, right? It's not like a little narrow line like that one. What's that? You know, it's, it's only appearing on these really cool stars. So with these cool stars, these type M stars, the outer shell is relatively cool. So as the light leaves the star, um, it doesn't uh, incinerate, you know, the temperature isn't so hot that it incinerates some actual molecules that are in that, that outer uh, atmosphere of the star. And those, are, those wide bands are caused by a molecule of titanium oxide. Now, I personally don't know anything else about titanium oxide. It hasn't been something I wanted to dig into. One other quick example. I wanted to show you this region right here in the robin egg blue around 4800. That's our hydrogen beta. Notice on this type A star how much darker the line is than any of the others. So this is sort of a Goldilocks temperature for that line, that hydrogen beta line. Remember, what was it? In that example I showed a few minutes ago, it was like electrons drop, dropping from four to two in their orbits. So the hotter stars, a lot of those electrons, they don't stop at level four. They get pumped up to like five, six, or they're gone. So there's, no, there's not that many on level four to drop down to two. That's why these lines up here are dimmer. Down here, a lot of the electrons, the stars aren't hot enough to pump them up to that level four. They go up to three and then drop down. Some go to four. Down here, the stars are so cool, very few. So you really can, uh, with the help of the giants who came before us, understand a lot about star temperature. Uh, using uh, just the differences in these spectral fingerprints. Oh, you know, my wife, she always uh, wants me to dress for success. She always tells me that. And I think this is probably the place to do that. Uh, you know, this right here, you can see that's the hydrogen alpha line that goes right through there in the red. That's like over here. Uh, and, you know, it's a mess. I know. Look at this. It's just, a, it's really a mess. The thing is, I know some of you at home are going to know exactly what I'm talking about. As you look down really deep in there, you see the color changes to gray down at the bottom. And the salon hasn't been open. They're not picking up their phone. And, you know, like I said, I know some of you at home know what I'm talking about. There are advantages to not having a lot of hair. And that's also too hot to wear for the entire presentation. So you see that crosshairs there? You can see in that robin egg blue, maybe there's a little dimming, but suppose I was a professional and I got time on the Hubble Space Telescope and I, I captured a spectrum, submitted a paper that said, yeah, we saw a little bit of dimming in the robin egg blue. It's not going to get published, is it? We need to be quantitative. And to do that, we do a really simple intensity graph. So this axis here is just brightness. So the star is narrow and bright. So this is narrow and very bright, right? It's really high peak. Whereas this thing over here, if we look at just the brightness, not the color of this region, it's not very bright here, but as it gets wider and wider, it gets brighter and then it gets dim here. So this goes dim, bright, 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 dim, dim, dim. But the cool thing is, look at that dip. Now there's no longer any guessing. Now we can say exactly where that is. We can measure the width of it, full width, half maximum. How's it compare to other instruments, to other stars, to this star on another night? Now we're doing science. So how do you get that graph? So my story is I wanted to do some spectroscopy. I wanted to do some science. So I got one of these gratings. I put it on my C8 here in Seattle, three miles from Pike Place Market. One Saturday night in August in 2009, went out in the backyard, right out that window there. And, you know, at midnight I came in, I was using like a webcam that, that probably there was some duct, duct tape involved, I think. You know, duct taping it onto the, uh, the nose piece of my, my telescope or something. I don't, I don't remember. Came in at midnight, I had some videos, you know, my blue jeans. I mean, I had grass stains on the knees because, well, there's Vega, right, in August. So we've all been there. So uh, Sunday morning, I tried to create an intensity graph like this. And this literally is my first data that you're seeing right here. And I, I used some of the freeware that was out there and I gave up, I quit after two or three hours. And it was just too hard. The software was you know, half in French, it was crashing. 
Uh, you know, it took forever to even just install and it just really wasn't up to the same usability standards that we've become accustomed to now. And I told my wife, I said, I, this is a hobby. I'm supposed to be having fun and I'm not, I'm just angry. So I took the grading and I stuck it in a drawer and I figured, okay, I'll, I'll find something else to do. But it kept bugging me. I really wanted to try this out. So a couple of weeks later, I said, look, on Saturday, I've got some free time. I'll just create a program to create the, just the graph. That's all I need. Sunday, I had it done. And this, then the graph that you're seeing there is, is that graph. And that's Vega. And so what that dip is, is as the light leaves Vega and goes through the outermost shell, the hydrogen in that shell, and we still need to determine whether it's hydrogen, but we mostly know that is uh, from our reading, of course, over the years. The hydrogen and those electrons bouncing around cause some of the light to not reach our eye at certain characteristic fingerprint colors. So even though I had the software you know, done Sunday morning, now 11 years later and 10 or 15,000 hours later, it's, it's almost done. <laughs> My wife keeps saying, would you get it done? I wanna start having dinner at a decent hour. And um, I think one of the obstacles to getting started in a new, uh, venture and i'm not talking as a businessman i'm talking as us as amateurs you know some new activity venture is the wrong word adventure yeah is um it's like oh no another software curve that i'm going to have to climb it's i mean i don't enjoy that really so because that's a little bit of an obstacle i want to spend just a moment showing you the software because i think it's helpful for you to see how easy it is to get this data and if you're an imager, you, you're already capturing images of stars. This is not all that different. It's a little dimmer than a star. There's a star, there's a spectrum, there's a gap. We can, and maybe we can see some gaps in through there. So uh, this is again from that first night out. So all you do is bracket in the region that you wanna look at with these lines, and you've now got an intensity graph. So this peak here is the star, and this data here, including that dip, is this data here, including that dip. So that's all well and good. It's really not that hard to get the graph. But what are those dips? You know, how, how do we actually do science? So remember I mentioned that Bunsen kept a catalog of all the elements that he burned and where those spectral lines were. So in that catalog over the years, of course, has been refined uh, by other uh, researchers, but there's one built into the software. So we can come up here and say, show me on the graph where the hydrogen bomber lines would be, where would the absorption features in that graph, the, the dips in intensity be from hydrogen? And look, we've got, a, we've got a match there, 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 there. And these are actually labeled by the software. There's our hydrogen alpha. There's our hydrogen beta. In fact, I, I should have that. Let me just turn on a little more color here. So this is a synthesized spectrum. It's hard to see in color. There's a little bit of a dip there. But we've sort of conclusively shown, you know, we've got so many matches, it's unlikely it would be a coincidence. I'll show you an example of, of where that was really a struggle in a few minutes. But on this star, on Vega, it's pretty simple. We can, we can uh, add some color to this. This starts to be something that really interests audiences. And this is actually a video that I recorded that first night out. I'm gonna play it back at two frames per second, which is how I recorded it. My seeing was changing over here, so the data is jumping around. So the cool thing about this is, let me turn that color off for a second. Let's zoom in on that hydrogen alpha line. You can see that dip in intensity there, but notice how it comes and goes. Well, we all know, because many of us have done it, that if you stack images, you eliminate the noise. So I'm gonna turn on stacking in the software Watch how that feature, which is barely visible, occasionally it looks really good, like that looked good there, but that's good, but you know, let's turn on stacking. At two frames per second, it doesn't take very long for that stack data to lose a lot of the noise. And now we've got a fairly symmetrical shape, sort of Gaussian, and the same thing with all the other features here in the, in the uh, profile. So that's really all I wanted to show you with the software, how to capture an image, get the graph, and maybe identify some things. We'll talk a little more about that later. So if you would, I'd like you in your mind's eye just to keep, keep this in your, in your memory. That, you know, it's Vega, there's this curve, and there's dips that are marked by the Bomber series, right? With our reference lines from Bunsen shows us where the, the Bomber series would be. Because I'm going to show you some uh, science that was done using that. 
uh, as we uh, proceed tonight. Some real science. Okay, so now we're back here. Here's some cool outreach that you can do. In addition to that video, I forgot to mention, in addition to that video that I showed you, well, let's come back to it, because I think it's worth looking at it without stacking. This really draws interest because it's moving, it's colorful. And what I found from the public when you're doing outreach or in an observatory, I mean, you could do this with a, a four inch or a six inch refractor. I've done it with my laptop on the hood of a car outside the portico in front of a Holiday Inn at a professional science conference. It was scary because here I am, you know, Tommy Field, you know, showing these, these you know, literal, you know, Hubble researchers, hey, you want to see Vega? And they sort of go, uh, and then they come over and go, wow, really? That, with that telescope, they don't know. A lot of them have never touched a telescope before. So let's go back to the uh, show here. So in addition to that video, this is actually done in France. This photograph uh, was an outreach in an urban area. You probably wouldn't want to set this up at a dark sky party, but they're looking at gas tubes here, and then they transitioned back into, uh, into real stars. Here's a DSLR image. Uh, there's a couple stars and their specter over here. Uh, here's a wolf Rie star and some, some lumps, right? These are, these are emission lines. Uh, you know, they're really bright, so they've spread out on our sensor. Um, in fact, let's look at a wolf Rie star here. So Janet Simpson sent me this uh, some years ago, and I have a confession to make to the group. I couldn't remember what a wolf Rie star was. I'd read about them like you over the years, more than once, I'm sure. But you know, things go in one ear and out the other until it's your own data, and then it tends to stick, as I mentioned. Well, a wolf Rie star, Wikipedia is your friend, you know, is, is a really massive star. It's like 25 times the size of the sun. Late, it's probably headed to being a supernova, late stage. Uh, a lot of the outer shell has dissipated really intense uh, stellar winds. And this is what the spectrum looks like. Look at that. There's carbon, carbon, carbon. Why would that be? Now, remember that stars burn their way through the elements, right? Starting at hydrogen, there's that CNO cycle and all that stuff. That's all I know about the CNO cycle, just enough to mention it in a presentation like this. But we're seeing part of the process of that star's fusion with the DSLR and a mechanical tracker in 30 seconds. It's pretty amazing. So this is an emission spectrum, right? So we've got peaks on it and bright spots. This is a synthesized version of it, rather, rather pixelated, actually. Let's look at another emission object, our beloved ring nebula. That looks a little different, doesn't it? Well, this is an extended object. And extended objects, when you don't have a slit, are almost always not interesting. They're just a smear. But in this case, because there's really only two colors, it's sort of interesting. We can see we've got hydrogen alpha and ionized oxygen. That's what that Roman numeral three is. Just means ionized means some of the electrons are, are gone. They've been ejected. So you can see the colors there. But again, let's look at another emission object that you're familiar with that uh, we'll look at it this time with a slit spectrometer. There's the Orion Nebula. There's our hydrogen alpha, same lines. And there's that ionized oxygen, right, with that Roman numeral three. It's clearly an extended object. When you have a slit, you can actually see a lot of interesting detail that you don't see with just a slitless grating. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen for a second and ask somebody uh, to unmute themselves, if you care to. I won't call on anybody. Just for a moment, tell us what your first experience, how you first saw M42, what telescope you were on, maybe how old you were, what did it look like? Anybody want to share that? Surely, if you think back for a moment, you can remember that, right? Anyone? Bueller? Anyone? Yeah, um, me. There we go. Thanks, Fred. Go to it. Um, it was back in Venezuela. I just received a C8 from a friend that passed away. The scope was in very bad shape because it was in a balcony and I had water inside. I took the water off. And the first thing I pointed to was the Orion Nebula. And it was, a, even with the telescope in that, Stay of damage, it was impressive. What did it look like? Was it, was, uh, what could you see? More or less just the general shape? Were you in the city? Uh, at the time, you know, my first, my first time that I took that scope out. And oh, uh, wow. yeah, and it, it didn't track very well. So um, I, it was a C8. So even when I had a, a 25 millimeter, it moved really fast. So it was a, a a painful situation because you could not see very well. You could see the 
uh, the stars and some of the nebula. The city sure. has very a lot of light pollution, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, but it was spectacular for me. See the the three the four stars of of the trapezium and yeah. part of the nebula that was visible even with the light pollution. Sure. Wow. And Rick, did you want to tell us your your M42 story? You're muted. Sorry, Rick. Rick, you're muted. Uh, maybe you were, or maybe your mic was off, but you were unmuted because we couldn't hear you. Ah, how's there that? Yeah. Ah, I think I started on the other end of the spectrum from Freddie. My first telescope, well, the first one I pointed at anything other than the moon was a uh, Parks 10 inch Cassegrain. Wow. And um, uh, it, it was uh, kind of, I, Comet, I was getting ready for Comet Shoemaker leaving nine. Uh, uh -huh. And so I was uh, setting that up in my driveway and stuff and started uh, uh, getting, I, in fact, I joined the Memphis Astronomical Society because I knew once I'd bought that telescope that uh, the last thing I wanted to do was to uh, let it wind up in a corner in the garage. It, it wasn't going to go in the attic like the first one did. It was way <laughs> too heavy. But uh, uh, the first time I saw the Orion Nebula through that, you know, my focus at that, of course, that was an F-13, right? 10-inch F-13 telescope. So the, the four stars in the trapezium were just stood out like diamonds. Yeah. And uh, uh, that's what I was focused on more than the, than the nebula itself. And it was uh, quite inspiring. Cool. From there, I went on to be a globular cluster junkie. <laughs> well, and that's a good thing to be a junkie of. Thanks for both of you guys for sharing. Uh, my experience was actually at the other end of the spectrum uh, from yours, and that is, it was right around the same time, right before Shoemaker Levy 9, I decided I wanted to get into this. And so I went down in Denver to a first quarter star party in, in, in the city. And, uh, you know, it's fun when you can remember when you didn't know something because I didn't know telescopes. I'd seen pictures in magazines and that's about all. So I walk out onto the observing field and what I see, you know, you know those, uh, those cannons at the circus that they shoot people out of? That's what I saw all over the observing field. You know, they were daubs, but I didn't know any better. So I queued up in front of a daub or at a daub, there was somebody much like some of you and me, you know, running the daub and explaining what we were seeing. And I was all excited. I got up to the eyepiece and when I looked through it, I was really, I was really disappointed, honestly. It was a smudge, it was a mono smudge. It didn't look anything like what I was expecting. So, but still, I go back and look at M42 today. And if you had a similar experience, you probably do too. So well, why is it we go back if it's just a smudge? Well, first of all, we've gotten better at averted vision, right? We can now see things you know, through our peripheral vision and our eyesight is a little more sensitive there, as you know. But really, the, the reason that I think we go back and look at these things is we go back with an informed mind. We understand that we're looking at a stellar nursery, right? It's a birthplace of stars. And with that knowledge, the, the visual observing becomes that much more enjoyable and meaningful. And spectroscopy has done that for me too, because I've learned a little bit more of the science behind things. Okay, so here is the spectrum of Uranus and Neptune. You can see these deep gaps, and down here you can see the, the intensity graph. We're observing the methane, the atmosphere on these planets. And of course, that's how we observe the, uh, uh, what was it on Venus? Something phosphine uh, on Venus. And that's how we'll discover uh, uh, ET eventually, is we'll be observing something spectroscopically, probably. Um, so this is just on a, this is again on a backyard eight inch with a video camera. So in 1881, Henry Draper, the catalog guy, he observed, and it was newsworthy in the New York Times, a co the spectrum of a common heck. If Hank can do it, so can we. So here we can see a really beautiful spectrum. There's a little string of jewels there. And there's the intensity graph of the swan bands. This was a spectrum captured by a guy in India, Vikran Agnihotri. He's, He's a nuclear power plant engineer in Rajasthan in the northwest part of the country. He was a newcomer at this point, and he was just using, what, an 80 millimeter refractor uh, and a cannon, a DSLR. 
he's now an expert and uh, really I learned things from him, which is all any teacher can ask for. So here's a more contemporary example of a comet. These are extended objects, but they're compact enough that you don't have to have a slit. Uh, now here, this is sort of cool. <laughs> Anybody who uses a C-clamp, you know, a vice on their setup, that's my kind of amateur. My problem is if I did that, I'd end up cranking it down too tight and I'd buckle the housing and destroy the camera. Fortunately, Robin Ledbeater didn't. He put a star analyzer, which he designed, by the way, uh, on the nose piece, and he waited for a Perseid to go through his field of view. And in one frame here, it traveled that distance. Uh, that's, uh, that thing there is the actual meteor, and that is the spectrum there. And at that moment, there was a, you know, an outburst, some sort of bolide, and here's the spectrum he captured. This is a sort of an esoteric branch of uh, amateur astronomical spectroscopy, but you know, whatever floats your boat. Uh, he does lots of other things. There are people who do just this. That's, that's what they like to do. So we're not gonna talk much about the sun tonight uh, because we've heard a lot about it over the last several years and will again over the next couple of years, except to mention that we discovered helium on the sun. We had never, never had helium in hand. We never knew anything about it. All we discovered on the sun was there's something yellow on the sun. That line there, that spectrum is yellow. And that was captured during a total eclipse when you didn't need a slit because the sun was a compact um, object at that moment. We gave that, whatever that was on the sun, the name helium because Greek, and, uh, Greek for sun is helium. And uh, then you fast forward 30 or 40 decades and some guys were looking at the spectrum of some gas here on earth and, and found that same yellow line. And uh, having done that, they were able to say, oh, wow, we've now discovered that stuff on the sun that we named helium. We've now got some here on Earth. It's amazing science. Even with the DSLR, you can detect the differences on uh, novi's. Uh, there's some, uh, some iron there, but not on that one. Uh, also, I want to talk just real briefly about Doppler shift in case it's not something that uh, you're familiar with. It's the pitch change that, for example, a train whistle makes as it goes through the station when you're standing on the platform. Right, right, high, low, high when it's coming towards you, low when it's moving away. So when it's moving away, it's lower than when it's moving high, uh, moving toward, moving, excuse me, when, uh, yeah, when you're moving away, it's lower than when you're moving towards it, when it's higher, higher pitched. Same thing with light. So this triplet, I love that word, it's almost self-defining. Suppose we were expecting to find that triplet right there. And then we observed an object, we found that triplet was not where we expected it. If it's moved to the right, we call it red shifted because it's shifted to the red and we know the object from Doppler shift is moving away from us. The flip side is also true. If it's, you know, if it's shifted to the other side, then we know that it's blue shifted because it's coming towards us. Let's look at an example of how that can be used. So we're not gonna get into a lot of detail on supernova when stars explode, except there is a type of supernova called a 1A, where you have a, a big star and a little white dwarf and some of the gas here ends up on the white dwarf. What's hap what happens when you pour gas onto a hot surface? It explodes, right? So let's look at an example of one of these type 1A supernovas where the two stars are, are circling each other. So there it is for a brief period of time, uh, it was brighter than all the stars in its galaxy. There is a photo of a, of a type 1A supernova, not this one, but see, you can see it sort of, it looks like a shell. Uh, I mean, this could be years after it went off. I don't know how long it was after it exploded. Maybe Ann will tell us if she knows when we're done. Uh, but David Strange was able to capture a spectrum with just a nine inch telescope and less than 15 minutes worth of stacked images. And there's the spectrum and look at that deep dip down here. You can barely see the, the dimming there. So here's the deal, you know, we all talk about standing on the shoulders of giants. The giants have figured out that there's lots of different types of stars that explode. There's these type 1As like this, but there's also other types like they call some of them core collapse where they, you know, they just collapse on themselves when, for example, they run out of, of uh, gas. So this, now this won't be on the quiz, don't worry. But here, look at this graph. So for a type 1A supernova, there's a really deep dip right here that's right around 6,000. But these other supernovae, these core collapse ones, type 1c, 1b, type 2, they don't have a deep dip around 6,000. So what we can do is, and that's what David Strange did, he was able to say, this is a type 1a supernova just by where that dip is. That's one area that amateurs can contribute, is there are often um, 
supernovae that are or objects we've seen brighten and we want to see what type of supernova they are. Do they have this deep dip right here at 6,000 in silicon? Now, a lot of supernovas are too dim for us to capture on our amateur equipment. So it's not like it's something you can do all the time, but amateurs do participate in that aspect of pro-am collaboration. Here's what David and I did. We noted that wavelength and that wavelength is right there, 6150 or so. Then we looked up from uh, like what Bunsen would have figured if he had burnt beach sand that at, at rest, that wavelength should have been 6355. The difference between those is from Doppler shift. I, I couldn't remember the Doppler shift formula. Fortunately, the math is pretty simple, just a division, multiplication, and, and actually a subtraction. So now what we were able to determine is the blue shift that's occurring because that shell is expanding towards us. Isn't that amazing with a backyard telescope that we can do that? It's such a distant object. In fact, Adam Reese and his team, just before the turn of the century, won, uh, uh, he won the Nobel Prize uh, about a decade ago for their research that you've heard about where they study the accelerating cosmological expansion. And they used type 1A supernovae as standard candles. <laughs> Somehow I think their equipment was a little more sophisticated than this thing. But uh, bang for your buck, you know, if you, <laughs> you had a ratio, Ab above the division sign is bang and below it is buck. So Buck we know is 200 and Adam Reese's is probably many, many millions. So he's got to get a lot more bang for his buck. Uh, so what about the spectrum of a black hole? Now, of course, a black hole doesn't emit any light, but the uh, material that's circling and spiraling in, it's going so fast it heats up and you get an emission spectrum. So here, David Hayworth in Portland, Oregon, Oregon down the street from us in Seattle, he captured 3C273, I've never observed it. And there's the spectrum. You can see two little dots of light at the tip of those arrows. There it is blown up and there again are those two little dots of light. And there's the spectrum. This is done on a nine inch telescope with a, a modified security camera. So this guy was 25 years old in the 1960s, Martin Schmidt. There's a great transcript of an interview with him that he describes uh, this whole process of his discovery. And it's linked to on our site and I'd be happy to send you the link if you can't find it. So he was really having trouble figuring out what those lines were. And he was frustrated and he said, okay, I'm just gonna go back to square one. Let me, just like most scientists, let's eliminate things that we know aren't what those peaks are. So he pulled up a, a, a bomber series. This is the screen from my software I asked you to keep in your mind's eye. So there's hydrogen alpha, there's the hydrogen beta and the robin egg blue and so forth. But they don't really line up. I mean, he was able to prove, well, those are hydrogen peaks through here. I know that because they don't line up. Except they were shifted enormously to the red and he figured it out. The reason they're so far shifted is because this object is 2 billion light years away. And yet in spite of that great distance, it's so enormously bright that we can see it. That was the discovery. And using the Hubble constant, you can calculate you know, how fast it's receding from us or how far away it is. It's amazing to me that we can do this with simple amateur gear. And you know, this light that has traveled 2 billion light years still has information encoded in it that we can tease out with our gear. It's, it's just, it's ageless, this light, it seems. Whereas, other things in the universe don't age quite as well. Here's Martin Schmidt a few years ago. Now, I've been rightly accused of uh, throwing stones in a glass house when I show that picture, you know, and actually, I think I'm just jealous of the guy. He's got a full head of hair. I can't say that. Last two examples and we'll finish up. So, so far we've been looking at things at this scale, right? Hydrogen, alpha, beta, gamma, a vega. And let's, let's just for a second, see how wide those features are. I'm just gonna drop a line, you know, that's, that's a terrible set of lines. Let's do this. I just want to, that's worse. I just want to see what the width of that dip is, you know, and it looks like, well, let's see, it's 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. So each of these is 20. So it's 20, it's about uh, 40 wide or so. So our resolution, we could see things a little thinner than that. Our resolution is about 50 angstroms. Uh, that's a unit of measure we use for wavelength. If we wanted to zoom in on this hydrogen alpha feature, we can't just zoom in on the software with our mouse wheel. 
you know, I know you guys have all observed the moon and you know, you keep adding magnification, you get to the point where it's empty magnification. There's no more information there because of optical limitations. So the same thing with spectrum. So then you need to use a slit spectrometer to drill down into higher resolution. So here is, in, uh, this is the uh, Vega and the blue is the moon. And you can see in their hydrogen alpha feature is shifted. We're now measuring the radial velocity of Vega here in the solar, or here in the Milky Way in our galaxy. Most things, uh, well, you, you can't do this with uh, grading like this because we saw over here, the smallest we can probably detect is 50 angstroms. And this difference is, what's it say here? 0.67 angstroms. So imagine reading out 0.67 on this scale here. It's not possible. So final example, um, it requires a visual aid. This is a spinning star. I wish I was a Harlem Globetrotter and I could spin it on my finger. So it's spinning very rapidly, let's say. And so this edge is coming towards you. So that light is, uh, I can never, never remember. That light is blue shifted a little. Whereas this edge is moving away from you. So the light that comes off the star that, that comes to your eye here, it's a little red shifted. Whereas from rotation, this spot here really doesn't have any appreciable change or zero appreciable change with reference to its velocity towards or away from you. So what you get, let's just look for here first, you get, all the light that should be here, some of it is shifted to the blue or red, and some is shifted to the red. Isn't that cool? So let's see what happens with the spectrum. See that blue broadened, flattened spectrum of Altair? It's flattened because Altair has a very high rotational speed, so it's broadened. Whereas Vega clearly isn't spinning so fast. Again, on a slit spectrometer, what amazes me is that we can capture data like this. So how do you get started? Real quickly, you need a, a grading, uh, you need a camera of any sort, color, mono, you know, cool, video, whatever. You may need a spacer or a thread adapter of some sort. And the main reason for that is the distance from the grading to the sensor needs, not like focusing, it doesn't have to be exact, but it, you can't have it too far away or too close. And there's a calculator in our site where you plug in your, your telescope specs and camera specs. And I spend a lot of time with guys emailing me their specs and I just sort of figure it out and tell them what they need. Uh, this is my software, our spec. That's my site, by the way. Um, this is that shareware I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's improved a lot and it's a really powerful software. And the people who wrote it I'm friendly with, they're, they're leaders in our field. They really are amazing people. Um, it's hard to learn. Still a little rough on the edges, but very powerful. So, you know, when you get that graph with those dips, sometimes, it, uh, most of the time, especially for, for me, I go, well, what are those dips? So that book there on the right, I want to show you two quick pages from it. There's a spectrum, but notice they're calling out what we're seeing. And even that isn't sufficient for a knuckle-dragging programmer like me. I look at this and I go, well, so what? There's nitrogen there. What, you know, what, what does that mean? But the cool thing about this book is it's got lots of text that explains to lay people like us, not astrophysicists or, or you know, doctoral students, what we're seeing. So it is, there's a lot of fun learning. And there's, a, there's a page on my site with links to these books as well as many others. My software, as you heard, is $109. You can download it for free for 30 days. The AVSO is jumping, uh, you know, whether it's Stella Kafka, the current director, and Arnie, her predecessor, both professional astronomers, they know how significant spectroscopy is. So they've been moving in. In fact, in August, uh, we did a, a webinar for about 400 people, and we're going to do another one in, uh, in November. Um, well, in fact, uh, about four years ago, we did a webinar or did an in-person workshop for about 100 AVSO people at a, a, a conference for people like us, the SAS conference in LA. And I walked through, they all had the sample data and the software on their machine. And I walked through for an hour and they followed along and asked questions when they had them, you know, creating a spectrum, you know, how to process it. So the software is free for a month. The sample data is on that page. And this, this uh, workshop is at YouTube. So tonight, it'll be a little late maybe, although astronomers keep funny hours. But this weekend, you could download the software, even if you don't own a telescope or never plan to do this. 
And you could, you know, whenever I say that, what I picture is, yeah, I don't own a telescope. I own, you know, stereo binoculars, you know, and, and one of those chairs with a trapezoid. I've always wanted to try one of those or those chairs you sit in that are, you know, I saw one at a star party that, you know, had all these motors and stuff. It was like sitting in a, you know, a, a space capsule simulator or something. Um, regardless, that's the kind of thing you can do yourself. There are opportunities for pro-am collaboration. Uh, the AVSO has a spectral database online now. The BAA has a spectral database. The French have a database. Uh, all of these names here are peers of ours in the field. This is uh, Robert Stencil. He's actually a professor at the University of Colorado. Not a lot of opportunities now, but more and more coming. So in the last uh, two or 300 years, as well as the last 55 minutes, we've come a long way, haven't we? Uh, I want to thank you all for uh, smiling at some of my jokes uh, and inviting me to speak tonight. I love answering questions, whether it's in our Q&A tonight or you can see my contact information down here. You can just Google me. You'll, you'll find me pretty easily. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, have at it. Let, let me know uh, what questions came up. Uh, there's no question that uh, isn't a fun one to hear and answer. So go for it. Thanks a lot, Tom. Sure. I do have some questions, but before I get into mine, I'm just going to open up to anybody else who's got a question. Just feel free to raise your hand. You can enter it in the chat or just unmute yourself. Yeah. So $109, is that a one-time cost or is there a monthly subscription fee? That's a really good question I should answer since we're all wary for good reason of getting dinged forever on a subscription fee. That's a permanent license forever. You get updates for a year and then after that updates, if you want them are 24 bucks. Um, you know, the software, it's now 10 year old software. So it's, it's pretty complete. So you, I mean, the updates, I always try and add things that people like, but they're not required in any way. That's a good question. I knew Jeremy from the talk that we had before the meeting that you were gonna be a troublemaker in the Q and A session. So, you know, go for it. <laughs> what other questions do you have? Are you getting back to your spectrum of the type 1A supernova, the dip in the spectrum, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around the significance of the dip. I'm thinking of, uh, I think it's Kirchhoff's third law of spectroscopy, where you have a hot, dense object that emits a continuous rainbow wash spectrum, and then you get the breaks in the spectrum from the atmosphere of the star. Um, going back to the type 1A and, and being able to distinguish between the 1A and the, the, the type 2 supernova, Right. The significance of the silicon. Um, it just correct me if I'm wrong. When a type, go ahead. Uh, sorry to interrupt. It's just I don't know the chemistry of supernovae. You know, as you as you know, supernovae do a lot of nuclear uh, nucleosynthesis, right? Just about everything we see came out of a supernova, and uh, so one of the things that comes out for some reason in the process, I suppose the initial process, and again, where's Anne? I'm paranoid now because she knows that I'm talking through my hat here. The, in the initial process, uh, you know, the initial, you know, minutes or hours or seconds, uh, there's, for some reason, there's silicon that's created that seems to be predominant in the shell at that particular moment. That uh, shell dissipates over time and then the silicon dip uh, becomes not visible. Um, it, it's, um, it's, it's just more astrophysics than I know. Sure. That's a really good question. It means you're thinking about what I'm saying. I appreciate you're asking it. Well, and then you got this chart of the periodic table and yeah. all the finger, the spectral fingerprints of all of the elements in the periodic table. So yeah. when you're looking at a spectrum of an object, can't you just match up what you're seeing in your software to the fingerprint of what's on the periodic table? Theoretically, yeah. Two things. First of all, the, the silicon in... Uh, in a supernova is uh, ionized silicon. And so a couple of the electrons are gone. And so, you know, again, as part of the, the explosion process, uh, that particular silicon gets created. Theoretically, you could look at the periodic table and match it to what you're seeing with the star. But in this case, we're only seeing silicon, you know, from that, um, you know, because it got created somehow and none of the other lines that you might expect. Supernova are, are weird creatures. Uh, the other thing with my uh, periodic table of spectra is in order to make it visually interesting, I included lines that were dimmer and probably not visible to our telescopes. So otherwise, there'd just be so few lines that it wouldn't have been uh, commercially viable or aesthetic. Um, but theoretically, and that's how, that's how professionals do it. They have libraries, much like you saw in my software, that you can pop up and, and match the features that you're seeing. 
Uh, and for example, um, Wolfrey A star, you, you know, you know where you're going to find the ionized carbon lines. So there's so many lines, the devil's in the details when it comes to identifying things. And for the most part, what as amateurs we do is we have an idea what we're looking for. You know, somebody's done it before, you know, for the first, you know, year or, you know, months or however long it takes you to get to that level. What we're all typically doing is just doing things that we've seen examples of somewhere, you know, or, or asking on our forum, what would be fun for me now that I've done Vega and I've done, uh, you know, methane on a planet? You know, what, what's, what's in reach of my telescope? I'm in, oh, by the way, I'm in the Southern Hemisphere, that kind of thing. Good question. It, it yeah. just blows my mind that somebody could use this software to capture the spectrum of a quasar using a security camera. I mean, that just blows my mind. How is that possible? The thing hey, is man. two billion light years away. Let me get my checkbook out and I'll show you that fee for being a plant in my audience. That's, so that's, great. that's a segue to my question, I think. Oh, good, Rick. Go for it. So is there, so it's the, uh, uh, essentially a filter that you're using, the, the grading that you're yeah. using. Yeah. Um, is there a minimum sensor size I mean, you know, I know it's going to change about how far it needs to be away from the camera, but I mean, is there, because there are a lot of, a lot of cameras out there with some very small sensors in them, right? Yeah. And then, then, on, then also, is there a pixel size that's too big? To yeah. Really, those are great questions. You're really thinking about how this gets done. Uh, yes to, to your questions. Uh, the really... The really small sensors, like the uh, 640 by 480 type smaller sensors, typically in a guide camera or something, those are really the minimum. I mean, it, it can be hard to find your target with such a small sensor, as you know. Um, so typically a little bigger than that, but almost any camera. I mean, the webcam I used 10 years ago was that size. It's doable, especially if you've got a good mount and you're pretty good at finding what you're looking for. Um, in terms of the pixel size of the camera, uh, yeah, you don't want to oversample, undersample, all of those things, just like visual imaging. And on my site is a calculator where you plug in your focal length, your aperture, your pixel size, you know, what that distance is, and it'll actually give you some green flags and say, that's perfect. Or it'll say, you know, with that camera, you're going to need to move that grading a little closer because the spectrum's not even fitting on the sensor. So because your question is so common and necessary, We've got a calculator and a, a video that talks about how to use it. But um, I think I mentioned earlier, a lot of the first video and on that page, I talk about uh, this also in text. It's, it's unfortunate that this is the, the first and perhaps the biggest speed bump to getting started. Uh, and so uh, there's a form there that you can just fill in what, what your kit specs are. And then I'll use the calculator. Typically, I'll just shoot a screen video and explain, here's what I put here. Here's what you need. You know, you, uh, with a bigger telescope, you're often going to need a focal reducer because, because we don't have a slit, the size of the star on the sensor matters. And so on a bigger telescope, uh, focal reducers are often uh, handy to get the calculator to give you a thumbs up with those green flags. Good questions. It means my old cookbook CCD camera stays in retirement. Yeah, you don't want to drag that thing out. <laughs> Just as well. Now you have an excuse. I'll tell you, if you're doing outreach, I really prefer uh, a video camera uh, because of the immediate feedback that you get. Because as it turns out, focusing is a little different on the spectrum than it is the star. I mean, if you square, you know, get your focusing really sharp on the star, the, the spectrum is going to be out of focus just a little bit. So, you know, you're chasing the focus just like you would normally do, but maybe even a little more so. But with a video camera, you can just run it in my software and just tweak the focus to get the biggest dips on the graph. So empirically, you're finding the best focus. Um, so, but with video, you, again, I sort of liken it to, and I don't know, some of you look like you may be uh, uh, of an age like me where you remember punch cards. Does anybody who's on video remember punch cards? Yeah, there we go. Oh, Rick again. Oh my God, there's a lot of us here. So punch cards to me is like static fits images. It's like, yeah, you have to wait and then it comes. Whereas time shared, which you all remember, a word that doesn't get used anymore, you get that dopamine drip from your program working, you know, almost keystroke by keystroke. So video is that for me. I'm an impatient guy and uh, not all that skilled with my camera. So I appreciate video. Video, of course, isn't gonna be a sensitive. The stacking in my program is pretty primitive. Um, it doesn't register, for example. 
Uh, so a lot of people will stack in whatever camera control software or processing software they've got today. Uh, but there's no need for stacking. The other question to answer for you guys, it wasn't asked yet, and that is how deep can I go with this? So normally a star occupies a handful of pixels in our normal imaging, day-to-day -day imaging as if. When you take those same number of pixels from the star and you spread a whole bunch of them out into the spectrum, you lose five or six magnitudes. So if you can normally image down to mag 15, you're gonna be able to image down with a spectrum to nine or 10. So you're not gonna get real deep. Uh, and stacking of course will help that. But there's not all, you know, all the processing that we've learned so laboriously over the years, uh, you know, to tune up our visual images and get the contrast right and the color balance and all that, that all goes out the window. Because as scientists, we want the data, the photons to be exactly the way they showed up. So we don't do any of that post-processing. Uh, we can do darks uh, and, um, and other sort of preliminary processing, but, but not so, and that was one of the reasons I wasn't all that fond of, it, of visual imaging because I'd look at, you probably know the book I'm talking about. It's a large format book that, you know, Photoshop processing, you know, it's an eight and a half by 11 and on the two facing pages, they've got on one page the before and on the other page the after for some procedure they're describing. And I'd look at that and I'd go, I guess they're different, but you know, I'm, I'm not sure I'm interested in that kind of subtlety. I'm a knuckle dragger. You know, I want, I want, you know, things that really knock my socks off. And the first time you see that hydrogen bomber series dips in your star, in your star spectrum, it'll knock your socks off because it just, uh, as you were saying, Jeremy, it's, it's just mind blowing that this data is there uh, for the picking. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the data is encoded in the message of the starlight. I mean, if you're, if you're in the astrophotography realm, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm not really an astrophotography guy myself, but you're spending a lot of time image processing, manipulating the image. You're not really doing the hardcore science that I think a lot of us get a lot of fulfillment out of. Yeah. With this, you're, you're, you're not only looking at an object through your telescope, you're gathering the data, you're looking at it and you're actually getting the opportunity to, just, to do some real science. Yeah. And uh, I think it's more experiential for, for maybe lack of a better word. I um, agree. I mean, you're, you're incorporating your, your educational laws of science into something tangible. This is about as tangible as astronomy gets. It is. Trust and with so much of the research being done, you know, I mentioned earlier, uh, I don't think I used the words passive versus, you know, active knowledge. You know, when I read a sky and telescope or astronomy magazine, I don't have any line here, um, and I see a spectrum. In the past, I'd go, oh, yeah, that's a spectrum. It's got some peaks. Now, because I've actually done some, it's in my bones. So all the science that I read becomes that much more meaningful and interesting and exciting because I, I've done it. I'm tagging along with those scientists. You know, we're never going to do the stuff they're doing with the Hubble or with these, you know, big telescopes on mountaintops. But being able to do some of it and the kinds of things, uh, it's, it's, it is really, it's amazing. Other questions? All right, well, listen, guys, I, I want to, uh, I'm going to head upstairs for dinner. And uh, I want to thank you all again. And thank you for the outreach, which hopefully uh, we'll all be able to do more of in, uh, in the months to come. Uh, it's, it's giving for what is paying it forward and paying it backwards. That's what they call it. And it's, you know, I was thinking the other day, and then I'll leave you, that sometimes when we were serving people and giving them things, it's not any fun, right? You know, it's just like, oh yeah, it's my duty. I got to do this. You know, I'll, I'll take care of this person or whatever. There's still a good feeling you get from helping somebody. But with outreach, it's fun, you know? You get that nourishment, you get that joy. There's none of the suffering that some serving requires. You still get all the, all the brownie points for doing it because you're changing, literally changing people's lives, you can. Anyway, thank you all again. I uh, hope to hear from some of you. Uh, spread the word if you have friends. Yeah, Keith, go ahead. Thank you, Tom, thank you. You're welcome. You're, thank you, you're welcome. great presentation too. Thanks I love the presentation too. Well, thank I want to, if I may ask, thank you, Keith, just to really for a second, if I may ask, I've given a lot of these presentations. Is it too long? Do you think, what, did it feel too much like you were drinking from a fire hose? You were okay with it? I, I think the density was just right. Okay, good. It, I'm glad, it was dense, I'm, but it kicked, but it moved. 
And Good. Well, I, you know, I try and throw some humor in with this kind of stuff just because that relaxes people. I'll have people talk about M42. But sometimes I wonder. A lot of people love it. I wonder, I mean, as, as everybody knows, Anne included, as a teacher, as an educator, it's hard to, to hit the right level for everybody. So um, thanks for that feedback. Have a I great think evening. I think, I think yeah. I could say that before the presentation started, I was confused. I'm still confused now, but I'm confused at a much higher level. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I think that's life, you know? <laughs> one thing before we let you go, Tom, I just want to say one thing. This really is an opportunity for all of us collectively to challenge ourselves if you really have a passion for this subject and for this hobby, it's, you know, we've all been out with our telescopes. We've looked at objects in the night sky. Some of us have done astrophotography. This is a doorway into another realm, spectroscopy. And this really is the bread and butter of observational astronomy. Yeah. You know, oh, what I makes astronomy different from all other sciences is you can't directly sample it. The starlight is all that we have to go by. And now with a tool like this, it's readily available, not just to the professionals, but also to amateurs to regular backyard astronomers like you and I. So it really is an opportunity for us to connect to the scientific aspect, not just the aesthetic and the observational side of astronomy, but really the integrate that with the science. So Tom, it's a wonderful tool. And I just want to personally thank you for the, the work you've done on this. Jeremy, you, you memorized that whole script I emailed you? That's fantastic yeah. what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful tool. I could go another hour, but I know you got to eat. So it's, 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 really, it's really exciting. You no, know, there was that song a couple years ago, uh, Something So Call Me, you know? <laughs> and, and I don't remember what it was. And I'd, I'd you know, embarrass us all if I tried to sing it. So it's probably best I don't. But uh, that's what just came to mind because the site has a contact form. I spend most of my day these days just answering questions, helping people understand the technique or the science, or they send me samples and I, I'll make a quick screen video in the software and show them what they should do next time. So that's fun for me. So, uh, so don't hesitate, ask questions, have a great evening, stay safe. Thanks again. Good Thanks, night. Tom. All right, here's my number, so call me maybe. If you're interested in getting in touch with Tom, here are his details. Again, the website is rspec-astro.com. Or you can send him an email, tom at fieldtestedsystems.com. Or you can actually go to his website and enter your details in the contact tab. Again, it's rspec-astro.com. Just enter your name, email, and, and a message. I guess Tom is on live quite a bit. So this is an opportunity for, to connect with him live. And yeah, I'm actually interested in trying this out myself. This is a fascinating program. You can not only do backyard observing and backyard astronomy, but also backyard spectroscopy. So yeah, very fascinating, very interesting. So thanks again, Tom. Uh, just wrapping up here, just got a couple of preliminaries. Again, our website is memphisastro.org. Check that out for updates on upcoming meetings as well as events. Again, officially we're shut down because of COVID-19. Looks like we could be shut down for a while, maybe, maybe well into next year before we start meeting live again. So Looks like we're going to continue to stay virtual, but check out our website anyway. And we also have a calendar of events. Again, officially, our observing sessions are canceled. But again, we continue to monitor things week by week, month by month. There's no reason why we can't get out and do social distancing style observing sessions. So if you're on our email list, just keep an eye on your email. If you're not and you'd like to join our email address, our email um, distribution, go to joinmas.com. And again, just enter your name and your email address. We send out updates about once, once a week. So if you're not on our email list already, then just go to this website here, joinmas.com. And if you're interested in becoming a member, one of the benefits is you get access to our newsletter, which is the Meteorite. And again, it's got a lot of great content in it, including articles and minutes from past board meetings, star charts and astrophotography gallery. So we send this out about you know once a month, and this is one of the perks of becoming a member. If you're not a member already and you'd like to become a member, um, I'll have links to these two documents in the description on our YouTube channel for, for this video. That's the October sky chart, and then also our membership application. We've got an electronic version of our membership application in PDF. All you gotta do is download it, fill it out, and then just email it back to us at memphisastronomicalsociety 
at gmail.com for official approval. So if you're not a member already and you'd like to become one, just download the membership application. Again, in the description below this video, we'd love to, we'd love to have you as, a, as an official member. So yeah, uh, download that. Now guys, also we're getting into the fall season. It's October and next month, November, we, we, we start our election process. And I'm not talking about the event on November the 3rd. I'm talking about the Memphis Astronomical Society uh, Board of Directors. So there is a nominating committee that has been formed and we're, we actually got a couple of board, board positions opening up. Some guys are stepping away, need some time off. So if you're interested in serving on the MAS Board of Directors, then by all means, please reach out to us and uh, we'd love to consider you know, having you and, uh, as, a, as a member of our board. And we got a couple of key positions opening up, including vice president of programming. So it is, it is a little bit of work, but you know, it's not one of those situations where we're just gonna throw you to the wolves. We will certainly work with you. We would love to you know, break in some new, new board members. And it's really a great opportunity for you if you wanna serve to kind of help shape the direction of the society. And, we're doing our meetings now via Zoom. It's not a, a huge time commitment or anything like that. Meet once a month. And yeah, so again, we got a couple of positions opening up. If you're interested in that, just send us an email, Memphis Astronomical Society at gmail.com. So that pretty much wraps things up. Again, thank you for taking the time to participate in tonight's meeting. And if there are any other comments or questions, please let me know. If you're not keeping up, remember Mars is at opposition this month. Hmm. Toward the end of the month, it'll be uh, uh, early evening, uh, almost you know due south overhead. Hmm. So uh, we're as close as we get for two and a half years. So uh, get out and look at Mars. That's right. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. October the 6th. In fact, I looked at Mars a couple nights ago. The seeing wasn't the best, but... You could clearly see some of the albedo features, and I, and I did see the uh, south polar cap. So it's better than it was a couple of years ago where there was a planet-wide dust storm. So now's a good time to be viewing Mars, other than the full moon, of course. Yeah, the moon's sitting right on top of it tonight. Yeah. And, and the seeing's not too good tonight either. Yeah. So Keith, Rick, Freddie, anybody else have any other comments or questions or anything? All right. Oh, no, sir. With that, we'll wrap up. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks again to Tom Field for that excellent presentation. We'll post this on our YouTube channel at Memphis Astron Society. And uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you guys next month. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thanks, guys. Good night.